Welcome to lecture 19 of optical sensors course. In the last lecture, we studied uh, Fabry para sensors and we also studied uh, sens few sensors based on diffraction and then we studied fiber optic sensors uh, where we studied uh, b what are fiber Bragg gratings and how we use cascaded fiber Bragg gratings for uh, uh, various real uh, life applications, for example, monitoring of bridges and highways. And uh, we studied uh, how can we make multi channel or multi analyte sensors using optical fiber. So, on the same fiber you can have multiple sensors and uh, it can detect a lots of analytes and that is the need actually that when you make a sensor you want to have uh, a complete sensor. It is not like uh, detecting one or two analytes in a complex matrix you want to determine n number of analytes using a sensor then it becomes a uh, um, more feasible towards real uh, life applications. And then we saw that it is more useful to have uh, distributed sensors and uh, we studied how it works and uh, based on scattering phenomena for example, uh, Brillouin scattering and Raman scattering mostly it is Brillouin scattering. Today we are going to study uh, review actually some biomaterial optics and we will try to see that uh, how can we optically characterize this biomaterials and uh, rather doing this uh, bioreceptor and uh, analyte bonding without doing that. Uh, if we know that there are certain characteristics of these biomaterials, we can directly uh, use it for sensing or detection application. So, today we are going to study optical absorption. We will see uh, what is ab optical absorption cross section and uh, how it can be used for sensing. For example, we are considering here hemoglobin and jaundice. So, in the living world, we have an organ say for example, this thumb and has various tissues which are of the order of say a couple of millimeters and then you have uh, tissues which are even much smaller in dimension and then these tissues are made up of cells which are of the order of micron size and they are made up of organelle. For example, here you can see a mitochondrium which is about 2 micron or so and then they are composed of even smaller uh, entities which are cytosol say for example, it is 0.2 micron and then they are complexes uh, which are about a few nanometers say here it is 20 nanometer. These are comprised of molecules which are 2 nanometer in size and then atoms which are even smaller like 0.2 nanometer. So, you can see that these are the length scales in the living world. So, if I cut down my thumb and then start cutting it into pieces and pieces and pieces and pieces, you will arrive to about 0.2 nanometer or so. So, there are various structures and then they respond differently to optical radiation. So, if I characterize this optical radiation in various parts, say I say that this is IR range and uh, this is UV range, this is visible range. Then what happens actually that you can see here that aorta are absorbing here, skin absorbs in this particular range, epidermis here in this particular range of say about 800 to 900, melanosomes again here whole blood in this particular range and here it is water and carbon dioxide. So, there are also listed different kinds of lasers. So, here is excimer laser, here is krypton fluoride excimer laser, xenium chloride excimer laser, dye laser, argon laser. So, and then you have NDIAG laser, HOIAG laser erbium yag laser and carbon dioxide laser. So, you, what I am trying to show here is that uh, these are absorption curves for different typical biological tissues and you have different lasers which can be useful for uh, studying absorption characteristics of these biomaterials. What is very interesting for us is this window which is diagnostic and therapeutic window in uh, visible to near and near IR because you have blood and epidermis and skin aorta and melanosome all the this absorption characteristics in this particular region. So, it is the region of interest for diagnostic and therapeutic uh, applications. 
there are uh, main absorbers are uh, proteins in this ultraviolet region, hemoglobin here in visible range and also here. Melanin uh, follows this brown curve while water is in mid infrared. So, the various components of these tissues have various absorption uh, characteristics. So, you can characterize a tissue by its uh, only by seeing its absorption curve. For example, I have taken the absorption of a fat and you can see that it has this absorption well absorption dips here. So, so character for is scattering contribution versus wavelength and uh, you see that uh, the, there is a standard deviation over two temperatures. So, that is why the gray region shows. So, if, if you have this kind of structure from a complex matrix, you can exactly know that how much fat is there by measuring the absorption coefficient and also you can measure if there is a fat or not by ju just me uh, seeing that if you do not have this uh, absorption wavelengths, you say that there are no there is no fat in them. Okay, so, this is for example, characterization of milk. So, if you have uh, buffalo milk or cow milk and then you measure the fat, you can say that if it is buffalo milk or cow milk rather doing uh, this uh, tedious sensing experiment having a receptor and an light, you can directly say from the absorption curve. So, if you want to have excitation process at different frequencies. So, in terms of frequency you can have microwave in this region for infrared in terahertz region and uh, then this is actually the terahertz region which we are interested basically and then you have if you see in wavelengths. So, it is the wavelength range. So, you know that uh, what kind of molecular processes. So, actually when we, you are in visible and UV you uh, basically study the electronic transitions like uh, fluorescence and uh, when you come to infrared on the borders basically you study the vibrational modes. And uh, this is more like uh, studying uh, IR spectroscopy, Raman spectroscopy, these all fall in the this infrared or near infrared region. Then you go to far infrared and then you study the rotational spectra, rotational characteristics of these molecules. And when you have even microwave region, then it will be polyatomic molecules, uh, their rotation. So, it, it is important to know that what are the uh, characteristic wavelength range uh, to study a particular kind of transition or particular kind of process. So, if you want to study say vibrations, you have to have your uh, light source to be in infrared or near infrared region. If you want to study say po for polyatomic molecules and you want to study rotational spectra, you have to have microwave region. So, that is how you choose your spectral region and uh, for example, source and detector for this kind of processes. Okay. Let us see what is absorption coefficient. So, to see that let us say that we have a chromophore which is kind of a sphere okay. and then we see that this is sphere blocks incident like and casts a shadow. So, it is like this you have a sphere oh we have we have a picture here. So, you have a sphere and it casts a shadow here this one this is the shadow. This description is uh, not all correct, but it is schematic uh, version of the real situation. However, it does provide a simple concept which captures the essence of the absorption coefficient. All we want to know what is it and this is the parameter which describes the effectiveness of absorption and the shadow which it cast is called the effective absorption cross, cross section. We call it mu a and uh, it is uh, it has units of area. So, you can see that it is like centimeter square and can be smaller or equal to the geometrical size of the uh, chromophore if we are considering say for example, chromophore. So, it can be either smaller or at the most it can be equal to the geometrical size and there is a proportionality constant through which it is related to the uh, absorption efficiency uh, and that is called the absorption efficiency. So, there is a proportionality constant through which it is related to the actual uh, value of the geomet or geometrical size of the uh, 
uh, sphere or you can say the molecule. So, you have a molecule, you sign light on it, it casts a shadow that is effective cross section, it is actual cross section and if you take a ratio, uh, ratio between these, you, it will give you the absorption efficiency of the molecule. It is a dimensionless quantity because they both have centimeter square, so it is dimensionless. So, absorption coefficient basically describes a medium containing many chromophores at a concentration described the volume density mu a centimeter cube. Actually, it should be rho a centimeter per centimeter cube and the absorption coefficient is essentially the cross sectional area per unit volume of the medium. So, that is how you define the effective cross section and geometrical cross section. So, this is geometrical cross section, this is area and this is effective cross section and this term here gives you the absorption efficiency. Okay. So, experimentally the units are inverse, inverse in length, so such that the product of this is dimensionless. So, where L is the photon's path length and travel through the medium. So, the probability of survival of the photon after the path length L is given by this relation, where mu A is the you know absorption coefficient. So, you know that uh, if it passes through length L, then there is a transmission which tells you that how much portion got absorbed. So, this is given by this relation and this expression for survival holds true regardless of whether the photon path is a straight line or any random line. So, you have a medium and you measure T and the length is L, it has absorption coefficient mu A, you get with this relation. It is similar to uh, Lambert Beer law. So, if you have say turbid medium, say for example, this finger and you want to shine light on it, you see, you can see a red light coming through it. So, this kind of problem we are going to discuss. So, in the ultraviolet, the absorption increases with shorter wavelength due to protein, DNA, and other molecules. So, in the ultraviolet you have absorption due to these molecules. In the infrared for longer wavelengths this is due to tissue water content because water is absorbing in the IR region. So, you can study the tissue in this region. So, scaling water absorption uh, by 75 percent mimics a typical tissue with 75 percent water content that is you can mimic it with a tissue if you use a, a slide filled with water. In the near IR region, the absorption is minimal and this region is called diagnostic or therapeutic window okay. and we already discussed it. So, let us move. So, this was the NIR region and we were studying here, it is smaller here and this is the terahertz region which is again uh, very much of interest here. So, we want to study here uh, this therapeutic use because here the water absorption is quite low. So, it is purely the absorption of molecules which are uh, involved in the study or you study in terahertz region. So, there are vibrations of water molecules. So, this is a water molecule having hydrogen, oxygen, hydrogen and it can have this of frequencies at this wavelength uh, or this wavelength for this kind of stretching and uh, uh, vibrations. So, in general number of vibrational degree of freedom is 3 n minus 5 for a linear molecule and 3 n minus 6 for non-linear molecules where n is the number of atoms. So, if you have uh, 3 atoms basically you have uh, 3 uh, degrees vibrational degrees of freedom for water. So, these are 3 vibrational degrees of freedom for water and it they, they can be characterized by these bands you know at uh, IR range. So, you can see that. So, uh, let us see some other uh, important vibrational frequencies because most of the molecules are carbon hydrogen or nitrogen and sulfur. So, you can see that C H bands are at this much uh, frequency or this much wavelength. So, you can have this table right 
from if you match with this table you know that which of the bonds are involved uh, uh, in the process. So, suppose you measure IR spectra with lambda and you see these, these lines then you know that what kind of bonds this particular molecule has. So, this is the advantage of this kind of study. There are certain lasers also which are performing at different wavelengths you can have these kind of lasers and uh, they have uh, different bond dissociation energies. So, for example, this kind of bonds we have this kind of dissociation energy. So, if you give more energy to it, it will break. So, depending on the kind of study you want to have you can study with this kind of lasers. So, this kind of uh, studies are also very important in determining the uh, molecular structure. So, something called laser induced breakdown spectroscopy for example. So, what it does is that you put a laser it creates a breakdown because there is a dissociation energy for a bond it, it creates a breakdown and then these uh, atoms are freed and they can be detected through their characteristic wavelengths or mass spectroscopy or, or, or spectroscopy. So, you can use it for lips. So, that is how you uh, use uh, different lasers for different bond dissociations and then you know that okay, uh, these are the bonds which are present uh, in that particular molecular matrix. Let us again talk about the absorption of whole blood and we saw that it is a strong absorption in red NIR region because the volume fraction of blood is a few percent in tissues. The average absorption coefficient that affects light transport is moderate. However, when photon strikes a blood vessel they encounter the full strong absorption of the whole, whole blood. So, they get they can get absorbed completely. Hence, local absorption properties govern light tissue interaction and the average absorption properties govern light transport. Another example are melanosomes which are also strong absorbers. However, their volume fraction in epidermis is quite low. So, local interaction of light with melanosomes is strong, but their contribution to average absorption can modestly affect light transport. So, what I am trying to say is that suppose you have you have the epidermis and then a blood vessel and you sign light from here. Though this interaction is strong the percentage of this interacting molecule not much. So, it light will pass almost unaltered that is what I call modestly affected or almost no affected and then you come to blood which is full strong absorption. So, you can have strong absorption here and then you get a dip in wavelength. So, that that is what you get. So, here this was suppose in this particular case suppose it was 0.1 percent it can be maybe maybe 10 20 percent or 50 percent something like that. So, it will be larger even. Let us see what happens to the layer structure of skin. So, you have uh, when we come from the top you have a hair shaft and then uh, you have epidermis and then you have dermis and then uh, that these are two major parts and then you have uh, different uh, muscles here and then glands. What is important here is that when you sign uh, UV on the skin there are certain effects which are taking place. So, UV can be divided in three parts like 200 to 220 nanometer that is called UVC, 290 to 320 is called UVB and 320 to 400 is called UVA. So, these can be I mean uh, different regions. UVC that is below 290 that gets absorbed blocked by the uh, ozone region. So, it does not reach to us while UVB this is present, but uh, during winter or rainy season 
it is a relatively smaller in fraction, but in summer it is very strong and it can damage the upper layer of the epidermis or skin. So, this is primary cause of hot tanning, sunburn or skin cancer. It can be blocked by clouds. So, in a rainy season or in winter it is less effective. UVA are long wave ultraviolet rays which penetrate deeply into the skin and damage collagen and elastic fibers. They can damage the connecting tissues in the blood vessels. So, one can think of UVB causing skin cancer and UVA for, for uh, photo aging because it is it is uh, causing uh, damage to connecting tissues. So, you it is uh, causes more towards aging. So, these are the important things, but when UV is shown on uh, skin what happens that nucleic acids absorb UV more. So, for example, DNA you can see has larger absorption than proteins and uh, because it has pure, uh, purine derivatives adenine and guanine, pyrimidine derivatives like thymine and cystocene. So, these are basically uh, bases which are, uh, have absorption maximum around this region and that is why uh, it is more dangerous uh, makes a more transformation to the nucleic acids or DNA. So, it can basically uh, cause a significant damage to DNA. So, uh, that is what actually people do that uh, if you have uh, if you have to modify the DNA of a bacteriophage what you do is that you expose it to UV. So, it will change its DNA. So, if you remember uh, we studied virus bed detection of bacterium. Uh, when we studied SARS and uh, there was a virus which was a bacteriophage and this bacteriophage binds to the uh, to the bacterium and it inserts its DNA in it. So, you can modify this DNA by using uh, UV, okay. but proteins have similar absorption at 280, but they are less uh, prone to damage. Uh, in the intense UV. There are other biological chromophores. For example, pyrrole this is a molecule which is a chromophore and which was in early biological evolution could absorb sunlight and subsequent synthesis reactions occurred and produced biological polymers and proto metabolic products. So, this was in the beginning. What happened actually that pyrroles found porphyrins and there are four molecules. So, it becomes uh, tetrapyrrole or porphyrin and uh, then it can uh, collect solar photons. For example, chlorophyll is a porphyrin, hemoglobin, vitamin B 12, chromosome C, P 450 or other porphyrins in biology. So, yeah, there are certain examples and you can see the certain their chemical uh, formulae also. What is important here is that there are different combinations pertain to different spectral uh, regions and uh, that is how they play uh, an important role. So, for example, if you have a, uh, a leaf from a tree, it will have a green color which means that uh, it is absorbing in green right. And then you can have certain molecule which is for example, hemoglobin will come it will be more towards red side. So, here I have shown you the absorption spectra of hemoglobin and oxalated hemoglobin and you can see that uh, this is falling around in this region where you have uh, lowest uh, uh, absorption here. So, this uh, blue curve shows for uh, oxalated hemoglobin and pink color curve shows uh, deoxalated hemoglobin and uh, what is important here is that their absorption spectra 
uh, intersect at this point. So, if we choose this wavelength, we cannot say that there is something happening, because they both have the same absorption at this particular wavelength. So, this is something very important for oximetry, because you want to measure the oxygen concentration and uh, what happens actually at this particular concentration, it does not tell, if, because if you measure uh, the hemoglobin concentration at different uh, points with reference to this, you can say that how much change in oxy, uh, oxygen occurred. So, at this is called isobestic point, where it tell you that chemical reaction takes place irrespective of change in absorbance. So, it can be oxidation or reduction does not matter, but all matters is that at this point you cannot uh, predict uh, any chemical change in this particular configuration. So, that is very useful for oximetry, but nowadays uh, people do not care about this thing. There are other improved ways they are using couple of laser wavelengths not only this one, but few laser wavelengths to say more uh, reliable uh, response for oximetry. Another example is bilirubin, it is also a chromophore of this design, which has an absorption here uh, around uh, uh, 430 somewhere and it is yellow co in color. So, I, I told you that chlorophyll was green, now you have uh, another one which is yellow and it is a very important uh, uh, molecule, because it is a primary cause for uh, neonatal jaundice, neonatal jaundice. So, when there is a newborn infant, it suffers from jaundice, this is called neonatal jaundice and uh, this is the primary reason that they have high amount of bilirubin. So, what happens actually that uh, actually this is a breakdown product of hemoglobin. So, when uh, the child is born, there is significant hemolysis of red blood cells and then the bilirubin concentration increases. The problem is, because this is carried to liver where enzymes convert it into a water soluble form and then it is removed from the blood into bile and then this can be taken care of. But in adults, what happens in newborns? that they do not perform this operation. They that is why, because they do not have this sufficient amounts of enzymes to do this to take care of this excess bilirubin. So, so neonates actually newborn infants are uh, at high risk of jaundice that is called neonatal jaundice. And a typical jaundiced neonate has bilirubin concentration of about 10 milligram per deciliter and this is the molecular weight for bilirubin. So, what you do is that because it has this absorption at this, it can break if you sign light of this wavelength that is why neonates are treated with phototherapy. They are kept in blue light at about this wavelength. So, during in this wavelength uh, and in presence of air, this again uh, this bilirubin actually breaks that is how uh, it is done. So, let us try to estimate the absorption coefficients and the absorption efficiency and uh, cross sections for geometrical cross section and uh, effective cross section for uh, bilirubin kind of re reaction. So, you have this bilirubin and diameter is approximately 1 nanometer. So, geometrical area can we have this. So, you know now this. This is a rough estimate. So, we want to see that uh, what are the cross sections for this kind of uh, molecule. So, at 460 nanometer say for example, the strictness coefficient of bilirubin is this which was measured using uh, uh, spectroscopy as you can see the characteristic curve. So, if a neonate might have a bilirubin concentration this, which is basically can be converted to in this form. So, in such a case bilirubin absorption coefficient at 460 will be roughly about 21 centimeter inverse. So, if we ca calculate in terms of concentrations, if you calculate to rho a, 
it will be 1.02 into 10 to power 17 per centimeter cube. So, if the absorption efficiency will be about 0.046 very small, yeah. but the effective cross section will be also smaller. So, it will be 2.1 in 10 to power minus 16 centimeter square and here the area was 10 to power minus 15 centimeter square. So, you see that one order of magnitude is smaller, you will have the effective cross section. So, the effective cross sectional diameter is about 21 percent of the size of the geometrical diameter. So, it is smaller. So, that is how you determine. So, if you know other way, so if you know all this uh, efficiency and effective cross section and all these values, you can determine it back that how much jaundice the uh, neonate have. So, if you have already know what is sigma a and q a and rho a and mu a values then you can go back and can calculate this concentration right. So, from here and this curve you can say that how much jaundice, how much bilirubin actually the neonate has. So, in this talk we studied various optical absorption domains for tissues and biomaterials and we discussed how to determine absorption coefficient, what it means and how it can be calculated. We also studied the effect of UV on skin and uh, we saw that uh, UV can affect uh, the, the quality of DNA badly and uh, we also di discussed the HB or uh, hemoglobin detection and also jaundice detection and then we treated it analytically using optical absorption cross section technique and we, there we can know that how, what is the concentration of bilirubin to say how much is the jaundice or how much hemoglobin one has. Thank you.